Global Art and the Cold War, written by John J. Curley, dismantles the one-dimensional interpretations of how the Cold War affected global art in the second half of the 20th century. He explores the nuances of East versus West, looking at the tired narrative of Soviet socialist realism against American abstract expressionism. Through his analysis of over 100 works of art from all over the world, Curley offers a truly international and fresh perspective on a subject that has been poured over for decades. And who better to peel back the layers of this relationship than the man himself? Author and art history professor John J. Curley joins me now. Welcome to Showcase. John, the Thank subject so of the relationship <laughs> between art and the Cold War has been covered many, many times. How is your book different and how are you hoping to tackle this subject in a different way? Well, actually, there's no one history of art during global art during the Cold War. There have been many sort of uh, more specific histories about um, you know, places like America during the Vietnam era or China during the Cultural Revolution, but never a sort of a, a holistic attempt to think about the entire you know, period 1945 to 1989. Um, and the artworks created therein uh, in one book. Um, so it's really trying to do something like that. It's a massive topic, I realize, but to try to find some kind of narrative uh, through that, uh, through this sort of um, huge, um, huge undertaking. So to keep it sort of simple, what would you say is the central argument of this book? Sure, I think there are two central arguments. Number one, the ways that art and Cold War politics are inextricably linked um, during, uh, during the Cold War. For instance, you have... Um, you know, during the 1950s, the most contentious moment of the Cold War, um, really sharp lines were, were drawn between the art of the Soviets and the art of the Americans. And then in the 1970s, during the era of detente, when both sides were cooperating a little bit, um, there are sort of interesting overlaps between the two, uh, the, the two blocks and the, arts that, the artwork that were produced. Well, you touched on it there, but if you could expand on this a bit, how, were, how was the art different on the two sides of the Cold War? Sure. When most people think about art during the Cold War, they think about perhaps a comparison from around 1950, a massive, you know, Jackson Pollock drip painting, um, you know, that was painted in, in New York City, you know, in New York and America, and then a large-scale Soviet socialist realist painting that showed perhaps, you know, Stalin doing something heroic or workers banding together. Um, and so these sort of abstraction in America and sort of socialist realism, figurative art, on um, the Soviet world. And for the Americans, a Pollock could become something that was emblematic of individual liberty. Imagine the autonomous artist in his studio making marks that stand for the liberty of the individual. And indeed, these works were actually shipped um, with support from the CIA to Europe as sort of soft Cold War propaganda. And the Soviet example, the big pictures of, you know, of workers banding together, they saw those as painted you know, by the working classes and for the working classes as a way to create class solidarity. And so in some ways, the sort of abstraction becomes a model that emulates the American worldview, and socialist realism was a model that emulated the Soviet worldview. And the history is much more complicated than that, but generally speaking, that is how we have thought about art during the Cold War. And who are the big names that you're talking about in this book? Uh, why were these artists so important during the Cold War as well? Yeah, it's a really great question. It's also a good point to mention that you know, there are literally thousands of artists I could have selected, so I chose the hundred or so that I really could tell, tell a story with. And you know, the big artists are there, Warhol, Jackson Pollock, Ai Weiwei, um, you know, Barbara Kruger, and many others. But I think Gerhard Richter is perhaps an artist who you know, captures the spirit of the book. Uh, Richter was um, trained uh, in Dresden, East Germany, as a socialist realist sort of communist painter. Then he immigrates to West Germany in 1961, where he is trained in abstraction. And then around that time, he rejects both abstraction and socialist realism and decides to start painting blurred versions of media photographs. So he found a, you know, a picture in the newspaper and sort of transfer it into paint onto, as a painting and then blur the results. And you can think about how a blurred photograph is both a figurative work of art, but also it's approaching abstraction. So in his art, very art form, he finds a way to, to literally blur the ideologies of the, uh, or the politics of the Cold War. Finally, John, if I can ask you to summarize this, what would you say is the legacy of the Cold War? What has it given us that, uh, in terms of artwork? Yes, I mean, it's still very relevant to contemporary artworks. If you go to the Venice Biennale or all these uh, Biennales around the world, you sort of see it. But for me, it really comes down to two, uh, two sort of stances for artists. They can either sort of thematize forgetting the Cold War in their art. And I think about an artist like Jeff Koons, who's best known for very large, shiny sort of, uh, sort of balloon dog um, sculptures. And these have really no political content, and they're collected by billionaires around the world. So in some ways, these become sort of trophies um, you know, for the capitalist world about art that has no sort of social function. 
And then there are also artists who really dig into the archives of the Cold War and try to sort of, uh, you know, peel away its legacies. And artists like the Albanian artist Henri Sala, uh, he discovered an old film of his mother um, sort of uh, supporting the communist regime in Albania on state television. And he basically, his mother forgot that this happened. So the, the film really explores the tensions between trying to remember and the importance, you know, the importance of remembering um, these sort of repressive regimes and the tensions and the struggles that the Cold War entailed. John, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for joining us on Showcase today. John J. Curley, art history professor and author. Thank you very much.